to the reasons why in a very short time. So the Revit P4 was launched in 1949. This is the oldest car I've ever driven and certainly the oldest design I've ever driven. It was marked under various different names, the 60, 75, 80, 90, 95, 100 and 110 and the car was on the market until 1964 when the P6 came out or the Rover 2000 as it was initially called. The various names do relate roughly to the power outputs. The 75 had a 2.1 engine which later enlarged to 2.2 litres um, that generated about 75 horsepower. Then um, later on there were the 60 and then the 90 and the 105. The 105 actually had two versions. It had the had the, um, the R and the S. <coughs> Whoops, no synchro. There we go. Reverse, unfortunately, in this car is exactly where you think first is, which is a bit of a nightmare. Try again. Sorry. <laughs> Alex is um, reveling at my absolute lack of ability to operate the gears properly. It's not unusual for me to absolutely mess up gear changing in old cars. And unfortunately today is one of those days. So the 75 with the uh, sort of Cyclops headlights until 1953. Um, 75 horsepower. Then there were um, two other models that came in to sort of be with it. It got very, got very confusing to be honest. It was, it was the um, 60, but it was a four-cylinder engine, also used in Land Rovers. Then the 90, about 90, then 93 horsepower later on. Then there was a 105. The 105 had an automatic option called the R and then there was the S that was a manual although in 1958 they dropped the R and just called it the just called it the 105. In 59 they replaced three models with two. We went to the Rover 80 and the Rover 100 which is one of these. The Rover 80 had a brand new type of, of engine you really, you can't, you can't mess around with this gearbox, it just doesn't like it. That's better. Let's go down here. The 80 had a new type of engine, but it was an overhead valve engine. All other types of P4 have what's called an inlet over exhaust engine. And um, there was actually a two type, there were two types of that. There were the, um, the Land Rover, the um, Rover P3 type, which the 75 had, it had it, uh, there were 1.6 and um, 2 litre engines in that one. And then the later, the later P4s, they actually had a version of the Rover P5 engine, it was still 2.6 litres at the time. But um, it was actually a completely different engine. 
I do like the sound of this six cylinder, it's very nice. So this is a similar engine to the, to the, to the P5 that was introduced, I think, in 59, from what I remember. And it generates in this car about 100 horsepower, which is, uh, I don't know, it's plenty. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's plenty of power. The Rover 60 and Rover 80 were the only ones with a four cylinder engine. I, I don't remember if that OHV engine was actually used in, um, in any other car. Certainly, the, uh, when the P6 came in, that was, I think, a totally entirely new engine. So in 59, the um, Rover 80 over 100 came, came out. This is a 2.6 litre engine in this particular car. And then they changed the engines again for 1962, uh, which was the Rover 95 that generated, I think, 98 horsepower. And then the Rover 110, which was very, very confusing. That was. That was 123 horsepower. I think that covers it. I hope so, because I'm now watching the junction, and so I better turn the camera off. You know, viewers, I'm always surprised as to what British classics you can pick up for £5,000. And having looked online, you can get a P4 in pretty good condition for about four thousand pounds this car um, has a bit of patina that's why the, the roof's a different color and you see on the side that uh, there's evidence of primer and things like that it's one of the last cars that was made in this country to have suicide doors first of all we will try to get in the back sorry if that has just vibrated just the way it goes on this channel you can't go forward, so I'm going to have to go kind of sideways. Let's see if I can do this. The bench has been moved back a bit to give me a bit more leg room. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's soft in here. Ooh. Oh, my feet do fit under the seats. It's red leather, genuine wood. It's got double rear courtesy lights. That's wonderful. That rear view mirror by the way is almost entirely useless but ever taking mirror there is the one you want to use let's just shut the door for a second to get out of the weather That'll do. so that's the door opening window winder enormous ashtray thing there we go huge ashtray a couple of friends and um what have we got here <laughs> massive luxurious armrest if you were very very ambitious you could fit six people because this is a bench seat model they did actually have a individual seat model too um but this is uh, this is a bench seat one little grab handles in case you cornered too violently because the suspension is typically quite soft like most cars of the era oh it's got double coat hooks as well um I'm very grateful it's got inertia real seat belts, it does make it a bit easier to uh, to actually uh, to drive with the inertia real seat belts. There we go. Let's see if it's dignified getting out. Oh, that's nice and easy. Getting out is really easy, it's for getting in that's the problem. Right, these doors are actually Burma Bright, which is the same alloy that they use to make Land Rovers, uh, although the cars from 1962 were steel. Um, I, I've been told that you have to use the handles to, uh, to close them, otherwise it might dent it, so we won't do that. Right viewers, 15-inch uh, wheels in this particular car. I think this is one of the weirdest boots ever, you just kind of lift it up. Look at that, you just lift it, apparently it just stays. I'm going to be really careful here because I've been assured that that doesn't fall on my head but alleged, I'm just going to be very careful. It's quite big in here. There's a lot of space. I mean, Alex has got all her things for the uh, uh, P4 Owners Club uh, meeting in a couple of days. And they all sort of fit. Another friend down here, just put the friend there so his friend doesn't get decapitated in the boot. Can we just lower it like that? Yes, we can. Fantastic. So this car's a 61. And so you don't need things like fog lights or 
reversing lights or anything like that. If it were me, I might fit them, but uh, it's personal choice, really. Uh, <laughs> these mirrors on the bonnet, or the wings, you can't see those at all when you're driving. They're absolutely useless. That's why we've got an overtaking mirror here. So if we get in, if you want wooden leather viewers, then this is the car for you. Look at this. Crazy. Right. <sighs> Famous shepherd's crook handbrake. It actually works okay. It's sort of like using normal handbrake. It's just got a button. You just have to move it forward and back. It's not too difficult to use. Uh, enormous, enormous steering wheel. Absolutely huge. The bench does slide forward and back. And so I have um, stood it back a little bit for me. It's actually quite comfortable, to be honest. It's pretty good. Um, wow. Reserve petrol tank, panel light. That is actually for checking the oil level. Um, when you start it, you can press that button to check the oil level. There's only one speed of wipers, and they don't they don't really clear much of the screen. Um, I think if I turn the ignition on, there we go. Make sure we're in neutral and the handbrake is on before we do this. Okay, Let's see if the wipers all. There we go. Uh, yeah, we've got quite a lot of them. My mount's in the way anyway, which I'll just, just remove, but there you go. You can see there we've got quite a big kind of unswept area there and only got one speed. Just turn that off and they park down there off the screen. This is, yeah, the rear, rear view is really small. It's a tiny window. Got these lovely, lovely... I think these are period sun visors. Um, hopefully those work. Just turn the ignition off again. This is a, a modern kind of a Bluetooth stereo unit, by the way, which, you know, if you use this on a daily basis, which Alex does, I think it's something that you're going to need. Glove box. It's actually got gloves in it, and it's a 1959 AA handbook. Marvellous. I don't know if my secret mission documents will go in there, though. The thing is, it's a bench seat, so if you've got two people in the front, you need to put it down there or something. I've got various auxiliary switches here. Um, I'll have to maybe ask Alex what some of these do. I've got a heater in this car, which apparently was standard. Wonderful. We like standard features like that. I mean, most cars at this time, which were very cheap, didn't come with um, didn't come with heaters. Dip switch is, sorry, not for the wheel there. Dip switch is just, just down there. And we've got something else up there as well. I think that was a push for the washers or something like that originally. Now look at this gear linkage. It sort of goes all the way down there like this. It's, it's crazy. And apparently underneath there is a dipstick for it too, which I'm not going to fiddle with today. Um, but quite enough of the other eccentricities. Look at this door panel. Um, that is not the door pull. This is the door pull up here. Uh, that's the window winder there. Quarter light. And then that's for getting in and out of the car. Little thing to rest your arm on. It's actually not... Um, you know, it's not that cramped in here, really. I've driven far worse kind of cars than this in terms of specs. Um, it's just this uh, gear change. Because <laughs> reverse is where first should be on most cars which gets very very confusing yeah uh, maybe not the uh, best all oh, the panel light Ooh, <laughs> that i think is the courtesy just close the door does that go off yes it does wow and wood everywhere i think i summed this up you know, one way of view is to say this car's most agreeable. We've got a padded dashboard at the top. It would have been a wooden on earlier cars. Of course, a little clock in there. Is that a, is that a, 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 a Jaeger, I think they call them? Right, let's take a look at this glorious engine, shall we? Alex has worked very hard on the engine of this. It is a 2.6 litre. It's very similar to the one that was in the contemporary P5. But that is a 3 litre engine, which is why it's called Rover 3 litre. So you can see here is uh, 
Here's the manifold just there. This is, that's actually the old filler cap. It just kind of comes off like this, which is interesting. Go. Uh, that's the heater box at the back of there. The brake servo. I thought it looked like a brake servo, but it's not. That I think is uh, is, for, is the fuses there. That's the uh, brake fluid reservoir. We've got a glass fuel filter just there. I must say, considering Alex has restored this uh, assembly at the top of here, it, it looks, looks new. Radiator, sort of here. Uh, that's for dipstick. You can also use the, your, the your le uh, level gauge when you start the car to check the oil level inside. You don't have to get your fingers dirty. And that is the windscreen washer reservoir. Um, it's purple because per Halford sell purple windscreen washer fluid. So it's reasonably easy to work on most of it. Obviously, if you ever have one of the four-cylinder ones, it'll be even be even easier, I should imagine. And little hooded headlamps as well. These are um, switches for the electric fan, which obviously wasn't standard in 1961. That one is the rear heated window. It's got an aftermarket reheated window, this. And uh, that one is the electric washer jets because they were vacuum operated originally and they don't work very well. I'll just show you in the back of the car. It's very careful to use the handle to close the door. That is the aftermarket reheated window, which uh, does sort of work apparently. Right, uh, time to go for another drive. Um, and continue to terrify myself. To drive this car, once you're used to this gear change, I mean, if it were me, maybe I would get myself a 105R or something, because I'm not getting on very well with it at all. Um, I was warned, but unfortunately I maybe didn't take the advice properly, so, yes. Never mind, viewers. We do have overdrive. Actually, I could, I could try overdrive. I could try. Actually, no, not, 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 not now. It's a 30 limit. We won't try the overdrive. We'll have to try that another time. Better we have got five gears in this. It does feel like it. If you wanted to go, if you wanted to go particularly fast, it would be nice to be in overdrive on the on top gear. But it's only on top gear, not on thirds and some other cars of this type. Gosh, it, it, it's quite, it, it's quite actually um, a wiper, not a single speed wiper, but it doesn't really kind of clear the screen in the way you'd expect. I think uh, our friend Mr. Seabrook would, uh, would say we've got a, a bit of a triangle of doom going on, um, but they do sort of work. It, it's very comfortable actually, the driving position is, is a bit weird, and the gear linkage is the strangest thing you've ever seen, the handbrake down here looks like it's a sort of a walking stick. They actually got the Shepherd's Crook handbrake in this car. The ride is very, very soft. It's incredibly soft. I mean, ridiculously soft. I do, I do like it, viewers. It's, um, it's a very pleasant car. It's just that the steering wheel is way too big. And um, there's no synchro mesh on bottom gear, which means that you end up just, well, in a bit of a mess, really. Um, that's all I can say. Ah, oh, second gear, right. Let's see if we can go round this, um, go round this roundabout without actually having to, uh, having to change down to first, because that would not be good. Oh, goodness me! <laughs> wow. It's like trying to guide an oil tanker through the Corinth Canal. It's possible, but you really don't want to do it. So, 0-60 in this car is something like 18 seconds. The quickest P4 of 110 with 123 brake horsepower and a Westlake cylinder head um, uh, did 0-60, I think, in about 16 seconds. So, 
they're not the fastest cars in the world. I mean, driving around in a P6, which of course Alex also owns one of those, um, you might you might be uh, able to see on the channel man, if, I if I behave myself for the rest of this journey. Um, must have felt such a revolution, such a light, and um, and kind of you know you know easy car to drive. I think that had an all synchro box as well, um, and you could get an automatic option, which I will need because. Um, I've just demonstrated that I can't drive these cars properly at all, which is no surprise to anybody whatsoever. Um, I'm not Steph from my driver classic. Um, so viewers, I think that's, uh, that's enough. We will now go back and draw some conclusions about this second. There we go. Wow. Okay, part ore tanker has successfully negotiated. My gosh, there's a lot of turns locked to lock. Um, the ore tanker successfully negotiated the junction and uh, we'll now go around and uh, uh, just draw some conclusions about this incredible car. And I can stop twirling my arms as well. So viewers, uh, should you consider a Rover P4 as a sensible second-hand classic? Well, I suppose yes, I mean you can definitely get a car for under five thousand pounds which I, I don't really believe myself i still don't believe that but it's possible they are though quite difficult to drive um if you're not used to it i mean if you got used to it and you love a bit of arm twirling and you like gearboxes that have no synchro mesh on bottom and you like to sort of you know have um have sort of reverse where first is then uh Yes, you know, that this might be for you. I'm very glad I've driven this car. The brakes, actually, in this are remarkably good. They are disc brakes in the front of this. The earlier ones didn't have that, but from about 1959, 1960, they had um, disc brakes on the front, which I was very grateful to, and servo-assisted as well, which is it's pretty advanced for that sort of time. Um, I've driven a couple of cars without servo-assisted uh, disc, uh, disc brakes, and, yeah, not so enjoyable. Anyway, thank you to Alex from Alex's Assets um, for allowing me to uh, film this car today. Um, it has been most enjoyable. Um, and uh, don't forget to subscribe to her channel. I'll leave a link in the description below. Um, and uh, also, we will be bringing you more episodes of Sensible Secondhand Classics very soon. Um, so don't forget to subscribe to the channel for that. Like this video, leave a comment below. I do apologize for my terrible gear changing. Um, that's just kind of what happens on the channel, I'm afraid. Thank you very much indeed once again. Dance for joy.